I'll start with Andrew Cox, retired master gunnery sergeant, thelostart.podbean.com. Get some merchandise and help support the podcast in getting our veteran voices out for all to hear. Now on all major podcast platforms, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Be a guest, tell your veteran story, discuss your veteran business or organization. Email the lost art with Andrew Cox at gmail.com. Andrew Cox, a Till Valhalla Project Ambassador. See the project story at tillvalhallaproject.com. Thanks for tuning in. Please enjoy the podcast that's giving a voice to our veterans. The Lost Art with Andrew Cox. Today's episode is brought to you by TrumpShirt.com. TrumpShirt.com is a veteran-owned business where 100% of the proceeds goes to disabled veterans and veteran organizations. Support your veterans by purchasing a shirt at TrumpShirt.com. Use the promo code TLA and get free shipping. That's TrumpShirt.com, promo code T-L-A. Hello, hello, my friends, and welcome back to the Lost Art Podcast. That podcast is giving a voice to our veterans. I'm your host, Andrew Cox, and today we'll be having a My Veteran Story. But before we get into that, are you enjoying the episodes? And be sure to go check us out on our website. That's thelostart.podbean.com. Go check it out, see what we got going on. There is a merchandise tab. Click on that merchandise tab, go in there, and get you a cool hat, shirt, something like that. Uh, help and support us in getting our veteran voices out for all to hear. And also, I want to give a shout out to the Till Valhalla Project for allowing me to be an ambassador for them. That's a great organization. They're doing great things across the nation. So I encourage you to go check out their website. That's TillValhallaProject.com. All right. With that, I got Harold Fleischer here, who is uh, Army um, retired, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, Army retired. So uh, why don't you tell us just a little bit about you? Uh, and then, so we, we get kind of get a brief overview for you and then we can jump in everything else. All right. Um, uh, well, I, was uh, born in, uh, Fond Lac, Wisconsin. So I come out of the Midwest, uh, potentially, uh, 23 November, 1947, 1976 now. Uh, so I have a perspective of somebody from the early baby boomer era. Right. Not a millennial by any means. <laughs> Uh, uh, so I do come from that. Um, uh, my uh, father and mother moved me and my sister, or my sister and I to be English, correct, uh, to New Jersey. Okay. Uh, my father was working for Paul Corporation and he was a salesman for in New York City and then in northern New Jersey. Um, uh, basically, uh, middle class upbringing in northern New Jersey. Graduated from high school in 65, entered the Virginia Military Institute on 9th September 65. If you're a VMI um, debt, you never forget the first day that you <laughs> entered the rat line. And you always remember when you graduate, 18 May 1969 in my case. And I graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering. Very nice. And a commission as an infantry lieutenant in the United States Army, second. Um, 69, so that puts us in the middle of the late era part of the Vietnam War. So yeah, absolutely. Most of my class uh, went to Vietnam. Some of them went to Europe thinking they'd be there a year and then they would go to Vietnam, but that, because of drawdowns, that did not happen in every case. But most of us didn't go to Vietnam. In my case, I was a rapid platoon leader for the first half of my career. Um, in the best battalion in the United States Army then and today, second battalion of the 502nd Infantry, finally called the second of the old Duke. And that, that nomenclature goes all the way back to World War II. Uh, I was a platoon leader of second platoon company D, which in those days was also a rifle company. We had four rifle companies to defend Second half of the tour, I was Brigade S5, which in those days meant civil affairs officer. Mm-hmm. And I uh, did that for the rest of my tour. Um, that was interesting because the uh, juxtaposition with my first half of the tour, because I was in the jungle basically the first half, occasionally on a fire base, most in the jungle for the first half. Never saw uh, a Vietnamese civilian uh, out there. Wow. And then now I was uh, the S5, and I was actually had a pass to be in civilian areas. 
job. Mm-hmm. And so, so I, I did, did have some contact with Wow. Um, there was, because of the war, I think, a lot of poverty. Mm-hmm. Uh, there also, there was heavy agricultural uh, economy going on, growing rice and stuff like that. Right. It was very close to the earth. Um, uh, uh, we also had a group of mountain yards in the area. Uh, they were really poor. Uh, both the Vietnamese and the United States were trying to give them some help. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the mountain yards were, were considered like the indigenous mountain people. Oh, okay. And uh, basically most of the province was a free fire zone, partly because the western part of the province was the Aishaw Valley. Mm. And uh, Marines might know the uh, you know that whole area there. Oh yeah. Well. Um, so it was not safe for the mountain yard to stay out there in the free fire zone. If something was anybody you saw that wasn't you or a Vietnamese uh, unit, um, then no good. Right. So, but it was interesting that to have some contact with the people. You know that the state that was sending stuff to North Korea to Vietnam and had been doing it for a while. Mm-hmm. And at S5, it would come to me and I would have to deliver. I went to the office. A lot of little kids. Mm-hmm. Some of them were older. A lot of kids. Because we were visitors, they would send some little kid to go get a, a bottle of uh, Coca Cola from some street vendor. So, don't spend your money on me. <laughs> yeah. Save it, save it for the kids. But uh, I had to drink it. I had to accept it. I had to drink it because they were trying to be polite. I had to be flight and return. But yeah. I, I doubt that any of those little kids hardly ever got a soda. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's like, yeah. But I didn't, I didn't feel really good about, uh, about taking it because I, I knew it was something that they really should spend on the kids. Right. Some of the kids are only single parent off, uh, orphans. Some of them were placed there. I uh, remember seeing one be a soldier. He was talking to a boy. He was his son. The son was in the orphanage because his father was in the army. Nobody else would take care Oh, wow. Him. Yeah. So they had situations like that, not just, you know, lost to both parents. Um, and I don't know what their, uh, what, what their extended family was. They had quite a, quite a few. Mm-hmm. And that was in the, uh, Way City area is where that was. Okay. And, uh, mm-hmm. Our battalion, when I was in brigade, they ran medical civil action control into various villages. And just, uh, a lot of the stuff they did was minor, but uh, uh, talking to uh, the MSC lieutenant from uh, let's see, second of the 327th. I'm pretty sure who it was. Okay. Might might have been. Anyhow, he's coming back from a med cab and he's riding through one of the villages that he visits on a different day and they flag him. This woman's going to have a baby. So the MSC lieutenant delivered a baby that day. Wow. So um, um, there's, you know, obviously some, some rapport that those people built. Uh, mm-hmm. With the, with uh, with our med cap and and vice versa, uh, uh, it was, you know, that that's a very positive thing. But the VME did have to learn how to set up some sort of medical support for the people, right? Because we weren't going to be there forever. Because I was in Vietnam in seventy seventy one. Uh, so that was that was close to uh, uh, the drawdown of everything. The drawdowns. Uh, Probably were starting in '69, yeah. and um, we never got any news in the jungle uh, ever. We would get uh, our best news sources were um, uh, when they threw some uh, Army Freeman uh, Eagle Division uh, newspapers and mm. uh, 
army uh, guard was right with the bag right. with the mail. So we got a little bit of information with that. My parents sent me a Time magazine, so that pulled me in a little bit. But the, the really the best source of current information was the chaplain. Mm. He, he would come and, and uh, visit us, and sometimes we were alone. We were just our platoon operating alone. He right. would come and visit us and start off his service where it was, you know, you bring your own weapon. Right, right. And, and uh, on an LD. And he would start off by telling us what was what he knew going on at like Mike Spencer's book. He'd say, Well, so and so is drawn down. So and so is drawn down. And then we'd also get some people that didn't have enough time to, to go home that would be reassigned to the country. Mm-hmm. One of the other platoon leaders. Right. Well, both of the other two the other two platoon leaders eventually one of them was from the fourth infantry division. The other one was from uh, Brigade down near uh, Saigon. I don't want to say what number, but I'm not, not really sure. Um, so we saw that, and we, so that's how we, we knew the drawdown was going. But we also knew that we were in Sui Tech Providence, which mm-hmm. is the second Providence for the DMZ, and we were going to be last. Yeah. And we were pretty close to last. We were the last division to start staying down, and um, we had a unit that was probably among the last four or five infantry battalions oh, wow. in the country to stand down. Uh, I think the last one was actually the first cab division. Cab division collapsed most of the units in the 3rd Brigade, and then they collapsed it further. And I think there was a battalion that, that hung on for a while out of the America. Um, hmm. So basically, the platoon leader and Brigade S5 in Vietnam Went to Alaska for two years, Arctic Test Center. Uh, his name has changed, but it's still there testing stuff in cold weather. Yeah. Uh, how, did you, how did you like Alaska? It was a real switch from Vietnam. <laughs> I can imagine so. I remember landing in in, uh, in Anchorage in the summer on the way to Vietnam. I'm going like, wow, I hope it was cool. Yeah. Was not cold, but it was cool. I'm going like, oh, I hope I never have to go Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> that was my next duty of and, Wow. Uh, well, you, you bring it up, Alaska. Okay. The Elmendorf Air Force Base, Fort Richardson area, is outside of Anchorage. Okay. Mm-hmm. And we call that the Banana Belt. Okay. Okay. Fort Greeley, Alaska, is located 100 miles south of Fairbank. Fairbank has a adjoining it, uh, Fort Wainwright. Uh huh. In 20 miles south of, uh, of Fairbanks, uh, Wainwright is Austin Air Force Base. And all these bases still exist. And uh, Fort really existed for the purposes of mostly the Arctic test. Okay. Most of the Rangers were controlled you know, by us. There was also a Northern Warfare Training Center there, but that was relatively small. Uh, but that was the other mission unit there. Okay. Um, I saw minus 70 degrees one night at Fort Greeley. Ooh. Uh, that was part of our testing. We took advantage of it. Uh, but it was located because it often got cold. Okay. Yeah. There's the cold triangle of, of North America extends into Yukon Territory and in towards Alaska. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember the name of the river, but I think it's the Panama River that runs, runs north of uh, Fairbanks. Makes a big circle and comes eventually down to the ocean. Okay. But the cold triangle, that's colder than the North Slope. Really? Oh, yeah. Because you get surrounded by mountains, temperature inversion, and cold weather sets down. Oh, I see. And I believe yeah. the North American <laughs> record for coldest ever is on territory on the eastern side of the cold triangle okay. at Dawson, Dawson City or something like that. Okay. I think Dawson Creek is on the highway. I haven't looked at the map there at all. But the cold triangle is there. And mm-hmm. uh, so that's why we were genuinely calling Anchorage, Richmond, Elmendorf, and Banana Belt. <laughs> that's funny. <clears throat> wow. Some of them knew that there was the Banana Belt and that it wasn't as bad as, as, as up north. Yeah. Uh, uh, there, uh, 
the Army's making a big effort to, to learn more about the Arctic environment and and, and being more in depth on it. On it. But over the last twenty years, they've really been just another place where troops are based. They sent to the same mm-hmm. and you know sandbox preparation was, was really what they're focused on. But full weather skills were something we have to have to survive. Mm-hmm. But it's not something we need to necessarily know how to fight in if mm-hmm. you're going to the sandbox. So they're emphasizing now in Alaska. Okay. More being into how do you fight. Right. Um, which has classically been the mission of the Army in Alaska. Uh, incubator for, for knowing that skill. Mm-hmm. Um, and there I went to Fort Campbell and I was in the first of the five of infantry. Air, this one for the rear kind of point summer. That's four and then headquarters company commander. Oh nice. Okay. Uh, left active duty and uh, started working for Southwestern Bell Telephone Company in Houston, Texas. And I managed to join the three forty eighth transportation battalion terminal. Um, I've used radios a lot in as an infantry officer. Mm-hmm. And uh, the transportation side decided they didn't want a thing lost, but they wanted somebody who had really had radio. Like, okay, that's me. <laughs> uh, and also, I had to be a bachelor of science in electrical engineering, and I was working for a telephone company, so I became their uh, thing lost. Okay. And I did that for about two and a half years, and they said, oh, we need, a, we need an S3 on short notice. We're going to annual training. Guy who was doing the job of leaving, you're it. <laughs> well, that was interesting because I had like four transportation captains working for me, but they still picked me. Yeah. Said, you are operationally better, the best that we can do. Yeah. And we went to uh, Rio Vista, California, and Permal Transportation Battalion. Uh, the main thing they do, there's a couple secondary missions. But the primary one is load and unload ship. Mm, yeah. That's, that's what the terminal is, the terminal. They can't operate an inland terminal and do uh, transportation between both trucks and barges and uh, trucks and rail, mm-hmm. stuff like that. And often in a, in a port, they could wind up clearing the cargo off the beach or off the piers into uh, either trucks or rail or barges. You know, so that's possible. But Right. But that's more secondary. But the biggest, hardest thing to do is to load and unload ship. Oh, yeah. And uh, they're a little bit crazy in that that part of the transportation court. They salivate. They, they were telling me a story when they were in Korea. And they oh, Jesus, a, a cement, a ship loaded with cement came. In. And they just, wow, that is great. Because cement, super dense powder. Yeah. It's heavy. Yeah. So they can set records on how fast they unload it and how much weight they move. Oh, I see. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. So that's cool. Getting a whole ship full of cement to unload yeah. allows you to set a really good time record. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. It's, it's the cranes are basically able to handle whatever load you need to handle. So you're gonna still make the same number of lift yeah. to get it off. Yeah, yeah, as you would if it was, uh, you know, loosely packed type stuff or ration or something like right. that. It's not as dense. Mm-hmm. So that's all very okay. interesting. Okay, so you're you're getting your jolly by loading, <laughs> <laughs> unloading cement. Okay, that's fun. But it, and it <laughs> it uh, um, and and the terminal service companies, uh, uh, a couple of the officers, at least one of the officers, had been a in a terminal battalion in Vietnam, terminal service company. And basically, it's a stevedore company. Brawn is important, brains not necessarily. <laughs> and he told stories about how they were always having to try to straighten out people who get themselves in trouble for some stuff. Yeah. Um, and, anyhow, what. So we, we you dealt with that in, in a training environment, and also when you went to training. So, right. 
uh, that that was very short because about three months after that I got changed. And uh, I wound up in the, uh, after a short delay, I wound up in three point of night supply and so I, okay. I did that for about three years as a field service officer and uh, I was I rotated to the headquarters, which was in the same building with a hundred and second field on the third. In those days, those were commands that they were led by major generals with a brigadier general, and they geographically supervised a bunch of army reserve units. Oh, I see. We had a mishmash of uh, hospitals. We had a lot of hospitals, medical units, clearing company, hmm. uh, veterinarian, uh, dental. We wow. had some JAG. Uh, we had the SNS battalion. We had a maintenance battalion. At one time, we had an ordnance group that, that basically specialized in ammo. Mm -hmm. uh, USAR schools, we had two of those. We had a field of early battalion. Uh, centered, I think, on Springfield, Missouri. Okay. So we had a, a real uh, grab bag of units. But mm -hmm. the big thing was that we were close enough together that we could establish a chain of command and adequately supervise uh, what we had. Right. In the command, and uh, yeah, I spent about I think it was about three years that time in the headquarters as a senior internal auditor, audited various things. There. Right. Um, so there was a conscious effort to try to make sure we were doing things right. Uh, I know one time I, I put together a pay audit, and and then the uh, which I had executed at the time, and then uh, at unit level, and then I, I was told uh, by the chief of internal review, well, the CG decided he wants his pay record audited because he does a lot of extra stuff, and he doesn't want to have any big pay record. You have to be in the Army Reserve or the National Guard. You know, various types of duty that you can perform in the order. All that right. Stuff. And, and the pay implication. And, but the CG had a lot of extra stuff that he had to do. Mm -hmm. So I went down to the headquarters of the 102nd ARCOM and I audited in his records, Deputy Commanding General's records, Chief of Staff's records, Headquarters Commandant's records, who was also the Army Technician for the prison unit. And then I, I pulled, uh, I think I had to do the Star Major. But, and then I at random pulled uh, two or three officers you would listen to people. Yeah. I want to find out whether they're doing anything correct in, in pay. And it turned out that the, they were gold. They, 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 I couldn't find any errors nice. and, uh, on any of them. And whatever comments I had were, uh, or findings and recommendations in the call were probably trivial or minor. It was, mm -hmm. was okay. Um, but that was, that was an indication of, and I saw this in that command, general after general. We want to do things right. Yeah. We want to do things right. And he was, that particular guy was concerned about, am I making any mistakes on how I'm handling my paperwork? Right. That cause problems in my records uh, that aren't, aren't being successfully done. So he just wanted to make sure that that, that was good. But uh, the same same review was done on other units. It wasn't just that. Right. We just exported it. Then I was able to escape the headquarters and go back to the 329 for a little over three years, spring ahead as a decorative officer. Oh, hi. For the battalion. You know, I was working for a guy I'd known for several years. He, uh, he wanted me, he worked to get me. And uh, it was it was nice being back in the 329. Uh, uh, and I stayed the rest of the time. That guy was in commander for about six months. I did so. Uh, his successor um, uh, was uh, it was an interesting time. Some things sideways, and fix them. but generally we, we tried to do things pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we were all technical units. Uh, we were not combat units, but everything in the battalion, we either combat support or combat service support. Had, uh, 
an S and S company, we had a field service company, we had two transportation detachments that were in control, another one that was uh, transportation contracting, and we had a small chemical detachment that was like second ship mm -hmm. for division level uh, MDC cell, okay. and we had a uh, engineer company that was construction support. They had rock crusher, asphalt plant. Oh, wow. They, they, were, they were unusual. They were not your regular garden variety combat engineer battalion or even construction engineer battalion. They were right. intended to be used to produce uh, gravel and asphalt that were then used by other units in an engineering environment. Mm -hmm. They would have probably been attached to an engineer construction battalion or, or a... Uh, the engineers also had some cellular battalions that they would put something to it. Hmm. So we had uh, quite a mix yeah. of companies that we were, we were supervised. Right. And uh, Tank Commander wisely said we want to spend most of our training time during throughout the year on technical tasks because that's what the Army needs to do. Yeah. They need to be able to do a lot. They need to be able to take. They need to be able to, you know, Brush rock and make asphalt. Um, they need to be able to do the transportation control type stuff. Right, right. And then, so technical tech. But every, every, we had to do rifle plow. Mm -hmm. So when we did rifle plow, we, we went to, uh, we always did that like in spring. And we did that at like a pre 18 because all the units were probably going to have to go into the field for part of their annual training. Mm -hmm. Right. So, by taking the whole battalion to shoot at Fort Leonard Wood, Ooh. we went into a training area and you had to set up all your uh, pup tents mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and man group pup, pup tents as well. Yeah. Everybody nice. had everybody had to get the weeds out, you know, those people who lost their mallets for driving tent pegs to their man tents <laughs> in, in the administrative tent, they, they figured out they lost their mallets. Yeah. It was intentional, intentional that to, to put them all in a field environment for Friday night and Saturday night mm -hmm. so that they would adjust and remember how to do that. Yes, I have yeah. you as emphasizing technical training most of the time, mm -hmm. but I know you're going to be facing this come in training. Yeah. It's just part of the requirements for field exercise during annual training. So we're putting your bodies out in the field yeah. environment. Yeah, it's important. On purpose, and I think we even said from the uh, from mess tents, you know, with a field mess. Tent. Oh, okay. Um, but that was a very, uh, very super. Uh, yeah, you're you're here. Let me let me finish this up, and then we we'll, we'll jump into it. You, you can come in. No big deal. Yeah. Um. So that was that was a really pretty good year. Although the CSM did look at me one day and said, "You're amazing." Most <laughs> most exos only last a year. You've been here three years. <laughs> and I go, "Yeah, I got lucky. I don't have to be in the headquarters." <laughs> and I went back to the headquarters and I had me doing chief material rendering in France, which cross level equipment thing. Right. And it was across all the units because they keep revising their. Um, Authorized equipment level, but suddenly something you were supposed to have was you're no longer supposed to have. So right. we try to give it to somebody that needs it or get it turned in. It was a big program throughout, not just our command, but throughout the army, cross level with other other command. Right, right. And then after about a year or so, they made the supply branch, which meant that I picked up some responsibility for not only supply, but I also picked up responsibility for. Uh, Food service to us. Oh, wow. And I behaved that. Um, then they said, okay, now you're going to be chief supply and service. So now I had, now I had that plus still had the supply branch. <laughs> the material readiness branch belonged to me. And I also had an office and report who were dedicated to doing reports and survey with investigations for stuff that people. Oof. Okay. Investigations. Yeah, no, yeah. They, we didn't actually do the investigation, but the units had to initiate reports 
serving, but there are guidelines on how good they had to be, and they had mm-hmm. to be signed off. Right. And the deputy commanding general uh, was a final sign off, and there was timelines to get it done. Right. Uh, so that captain, she got a lot of face time with uh, the TCG, <laughs> <laughs> which, which was fine. You know, I, I, I had no problem with that. She, she did a good job. Uh, but that was a scope of responsibility. Wow. And at that time, the Fifth Army was doing command logistic readiness team inspections. And they'd come out and they'd inspect every unit down to unit level in, right. in a ARCOM or what they call a general officer from the COCOM. The teams would come in and and supply. Mm-hmm. And so we would go out pre inspect. And uh, um, when I started, we were not doing too bad, but the maintenance branch, the maintenance division, they were getting like 95% pass rate. And I did this while. Wow. I did a little while. I mean, I did it. I don't know. I have to go back and look at the records. But it was like, I did multiple types of work. Yeah. The chief supply and service division. Mm-hmm. About once every 12 to 18 months. Oh, wow. And uh, one day, the uh, maintenance guy looked up and said, Catching up to it and making a sweat because we had rolled up. But you uh, working with uh, the units closely and also working with the inspectors, you began to know all the clerks. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. So it it I, I remember walking into one main company and I'm doing a pre inspection, looking at it. And it's all bad up to this point, and then from here it's all good. And it looked up and said, "This is when you were assigned, wasn't it?" He said, "Yes." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I said this is perfect this way. Unfortunately, they're going to also inspect back here. Yeah, and this is really trash. There's no, and I said you've done the best you can. Yeah, don't get me wrong. And I told this company commander he did the best he could. By that time, I was lieutenant colonel, so I was not exactly um, an insignificant person at that point. Yeah, so if I said that he did everything that he possibly could to the company, and that was helped him a lot. Yeah. Um, but it, I was honest with them. I said, this is what they're going to nail you on. Bang, 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 bang. Mm-hmm. And the inspector comes in. I knew who it was going to be. And absolutely. Every Everything you was, said. It's- yeah. <laughs> I, I knew the guy. I knew what the guy I was going to look at. I knew what they were responsible for. And I knew the quality of it. And I think the five army guy said, yeah, you fail on this, but we can see next time you're going to be good. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. You're going to be good next time because we can see what you have done mm-hmm. as compared to what was not. There was that the, the position was vacant for a while. Oh, I see. Yeah. And so the unit did a poor job covering things. Um, mm-hmm. So we 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 did that, and you know, you go into a JAG unit and they own rifle, I don't know, typewriters or something, but not much yeah. in the way of equipment. And they're kind of funny. They they would be let's make a deal. Uh, with the inspector. You know, well, we got this part right. Should we get credit for this? Yeah. They, yeah. they try to argue. <laughs> and they're dealing yeah, with, uh, most for most part, these guys are civilians. Yeah. But some of them are retired war officers and senior NCOs. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, so there's a lot of differences. And, uh, um, it, it was an interest. Uh, then I was the, uh, Assistant Deputy Chief of Staff for Logistics, which meant I was the number two in the, in the logistics organization at headquarters. And wow. then, I, then uh, with some help from some friends, I was managed to escape uh, the headquarters to Washington, Missouri, and I took command of the 3rd Battalion, 335th Infantry Regiment, which uh, at that time was a part of the 85th Division. And it, it, uh, was the basic combat training is what it did. That was its mission. Oh, I see. Okay. I was authorized, mm, I think, 99 people. And I told them, told them when I took command, I know I, I know I can't do it by myself. And the Army doesn't believe I can do it by myself. So they gave me 99 people. They don't <laughs> actually give you people easily. Yeah. So I know I need you. And uh, uh, I would say probably, let's say there were 12. I had almost 50 drill sergeants, and, and that was the big thing. And, and wow. The BCT, uh, Army Reserve Unit, was getting and training up drill sergeants. Yeah. And getting them proficient. 
Mm -hmm. And so you would have some that were fully proficient. You had some that were in drill sergeant positions that were going to drill sergeant school. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so the beautiful APs would be where you would go to a major army base, take over a uh, BCT company for two weeks. Oh, I see. Okay. Each company would take over uh, for two weeks. Right. And I had four of them so it would be overlap. Okay. Um, but that's not the first mission we did. The first mission we did was uh, first year we, we wound up uh, we canceled the mission which was to actually stand up a, a whole BCT battalion uh, and run it for for a uh, brigade was going to do it and run it for the, a whole cycle I canceled that I don't remember why and I wound up sending uh, three companies um, to West Point to do map reading and other subjects what they call their interim period between the fall semester and uh, the winter semester. Huh. And they did very well. They did very well. They, the following report came back. Uh, they did very well. Uh, but I didn't get to go because they didn't need me. Um, yeah. Well, at this point, you were uh, you still a lieutenant colonel? Or did you get, yeah, you get I was still a lieutenant colonel. And then, then uh, the next year, we, we got to go to uh, Fort Bragg, now mm -hmm. Fort Liberty, and we for the RPC range fire, and uh, there was going to be it was going to take like six, seven weeks to shoot all the cadets that were coming in. I forget exactly how many yeah. there were, but they were coming. Quite in. a few. If it's going to take that long. Yeah, and so uh, we were overlapped. Uh, uh, there was a lead battalion, a center battalion, and a trail battalion. And the lead battalion was going one week early to get set up, and they were going to run it for a week. Oh, I see. And then we were going to overlap there too and take it over and run it too. Yeah. And overlap. And, and by the time we got it done, the, the brigade would have taken care of, of, of the whole ROTC summer shooting. Wow. Now, there was a committee structure uh, of ROTC officers that we were working for, which is fun. It, it's their camp, and we were support. And I also had some attachments from, uh, by that time, the 84th. It might have been renamed to the 1st Battalion 334th Infantry by that point. There was a reorganization going on. And uh, uh, so I had actually some people from 84 from the Training Support Brigade that were there as well mm -hmm. uh, that were specialized in like range, op range operations, which was cool because we didn't do range, range operations. Yeah. We, we could work with the uh, private sort of cadet on the line, not a problem. Mm -hmm. We give the instruction of how to shoot a teddy hole factor, all that stuff, not a problem. Uh, we did that. That was that was that was that year. And then the following year, we actually rotated people to uh, Knox, and they took over a BCT cycle. Oh wow! I okay. Went, I think I went three times. I, I had three companies that went. And I think I visited each one at, at some point yeah. during their cycle. And then another battalion took over the last four weeks. And uh, and then I went back and uh, for the graduation. Interestingly enough, I had met the battalion commander that was at uh, Fort Jackson. He was selected to go be a BCP tank, tank mm -hmm. duty. I was eligible to go to the brigade battalion. Brigade Tank Commander at Fort Jack. Mm -hmm. And so the, the class is usually a mix of service. Right. And, and I actually met him there. Huh. And lo and behold, we get this assignment and he's at Knox and I know him already. Yeah. And uh, even more interesting, their picture hanging on the wall, I think we're the first battalion of the 46th Infantry, was a person who had been a professor when I was at at uh, BMI. Oh, wow. In World War II, he actually served with the unit. So it was kind of, kind of, so I, I went back for the graduation. So, um, um, and it was, I actually, I had just been moved back to the headquarters of the archive in between the finishing of the last company mm -hmm. and the graduation in that hole there. I wound up going back to the headquarters of the oh, wow. You know, where I pinned down my 
my Eagles, and I finished out my time as the chief, chief, chief budget guy. I had the deputy chief of staff resource manager, big budget, and uh, that's fun. Well, you got all sorts of buckets of money. Um, you know, paying allowances, most of that's funded at, at the uh, army level, but yeah, then sure. there's other money that that passed out to operations. And you got to kind of manage all, all the money oh, and all yeah, the different oh, pots yeah. of pie. You're, you're giving so. money to support sending every unit in your command and in training. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? So you got to say, well, where are they going? Yeah. Or how much are going to be? Down the road. Yeah. If, if that's not going to cut it, I, uh, one year I went to Bliss with 3.8. That's the cut. Okay, that, that costs the money. And then you got to you got to do the planning. One year we went to... Uh, um, Black Hill, South Dakota, and yeah. based on Camp Camp Rapid, that Rapid City, and that was National Guard base. So the funding thing is something that that has to be done for every unit. Mm -hmm. You can't say, "Well, I got a pile of money; I'll spend it any way I want." You know, they right. gave yeah. it to you to support getting them getting certain things done. One of the big things, of course, was annual training because uh, suddenly they're uh, um, have to travel a long way. To yeah. Consuming supplies, school. You have to do what they call fun. Here, we. This is how you charge all the food that you issue to us. Oh, you know, we pay for that. This is how you charge the fuel. You know, we pay for that. We had to arrange transportation to and from uh, annual training sites. Sometimes it was a ground convoy. And sometimes it was a mix of ground convoy, bus, or air. Mm -hmm. Kind of depending where they're going and how right. far. Um, most units didn't have enough vehicles to move everybody. So what it was, uh, you yeah. needed vehicles to move the equipment that you would need during annual training, and uh, and you'd have people with that, and then the main body would go go separately, yeah. usually by air. Um, Interesting. So now that was it. I uh, finished up in the Army Reserve. Thing. Number of ninety six. Oh wow! So okay. Altogether, I had a little over twenty seven years service between the active and active. Wow, that's um, incredible. The uh, uh, did a lot of interesting things along the way. A lot of different things. I was mm -hmm. I wasn't pure infantry and after I left active duty. I didn't do pure infantry again until I went to basic combat training. Yeah, and. Uh, uh, I mean, I'd, I'd say you hit just about everything you could hit, you know, doing the different tasks along the yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, flexibility was required because when you're a, a reservist, you, you have to kind of be what you hit. Right, right. All right. right. Yeah. You, what do you guys got here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is my background. You know, how can I fit in? Yeah. What do I need to learn? Um, uh, along the way, I actually... Uh, uh, changed branch temporarily to quartermaster because I was I was going to apply for command of three twenty ninth at that time when it came up on its next, next cycle and I was qualified so between everything I'd done both at the when I was in the S and S the time yeah. I had been in S four possibly the the for headquarters so I was I was qualified for that changed the quartermaster and then um, it was an issue down there and it was a sudden change about a four thing. Somebody was relieved, they brought mm. somebody in there and the opportunity was operated. Yeah. And I also uh, was talking about moving a signal time from the east coast east somewhere to our area. Oh uh -huh. and I go like me. Yeah. And and so I actually put the paperwork in, changed the signal for it, and then the um, then they put that plan on hold, and eventually they canceled it. Mm. Um, and so they said, "Well, they're all ready to sign off on it. Do you want to still continue?" And I go, "Like, it hardly makes any sense." Yeah. So, uh, but I I could have been a signal corps officer. Wow. As well. Um, 
Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd have been happy doing that. I actually looked at the the unit's organization pretty closely and the type of equipment it had and go, oh, yeah, multi-channel, long-distance stuff. Yeah. It's different than what we were using in the Southwestern Bell, but conceptually it was, it was the same microwave power and yeah. stuff like that. It was like an area signal to time. Right. Um, uh, so, yeah, I wound up uh, doing quite a, a lot of different things. I always liked the infantry stuff best, um, but you had to be what was there. Right. So, uh, and that, that's pretty true for both anybody who's uh, working in reserve component. Yeah, absolutely. As a civilian. Um, the Army Reserve, you know, has a, a slogan of twice the citizen. Once, once as a civilian and once as a reservist. Mm. And their logo, uh, one of their symbols, logo, is with the head with two faces. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. I, it may even be a part of their show. Uh, in things I don't remember, but that was one of their, their things, emphasizing the duality of, of what people do right. in the Army Reserve. They're, mm-hmm. they're civilians and they're reserves at the same time. Wow. Um, they're different from the National Guard. The National mm-hmm. Guard is something um, state military justice code, and they're right. subject to a state mission. Uh, I know that when we had big flood in uh, Missouri, uh, they mobilized their National Guard and had Air National Guard mm-hmm. sent to Washington, Missouri to make sure nobody crossed the bridge and flood yeah. Yeah. out of Washington, Missouri. And, uh, and so what wound up happening is my, my technician your technician opened up my center and the, the guardsmen stayed in our center. Oh, wow. There wasn't a National Guard armory there. So yeah. it was, huh. we cooperated with them mm-hmm. is what it came down. I think the closest National Guard unit was about 15 miles south mm-hmm. of Washington and we borrowed equipment from them. So there was a, uh, they're different in there, but they're at the same time typical supportive organizations. Right. Um, but their money buckets are different. <laughs> yeah. And they, they will not eat with you because they have a money bucket for Army Reserve and there's a money bucket for Army National Guard. So they don't do a joint mess hall with anybody because they have this no kidding. funding issue. And uh, that's handled uh, through a uh, a, uh, there's a U.S. fiscal and property officer assigned to every state, mm. and that is the funnel through which money and equipment goes through to the National Guard in that state, both Army wow. and Air. The one to protect us is up at Camp Rainbury, which is the headquarters for the Texas, Texas uh, National Guard. Right. Um, so there, there's that uh, relationship going on. Uh, but uh, I remember we had one unit that was uh, lighter. Uh, they were they all cargo and small tractor alligator type stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think it was 15 tons. And they had like 30 or 40. Things. And they brought them all to AC. I think they were from Alabama. And, oh, yeah, we're going to be over here in the swamp because it's easier to get the boats in that way. <laughs> And they ran their own meth hall and everything else. Oh, they wow. were attached to the uh, transportation firm. We had some other companies that were all reserve. But they were the National Guard. Yeah. And they were perfect. They they, they were supposed to pick up cargo and move it in their boat and bring it ashore. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what they did. Yeah. But they ran their own little, like, employment area and meth hall and maintenance facility and all that, like, by themselves. Yeah. Um. But they, they were they were not in it. Uh, hmm. uh, but I know part of it was driven by the fact they had their own fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, money money drives many things. So <laughs> uh, it drives us both. Yeah. You want to know the truth? Yeah. And it drives uh, drives veterans to foreign war. Yeah, most definitely. It, it takes uh, some funds going to Washington D.C. to help uh, state the case for support of veterans. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, 
main reason I joined BFW, uh, I was visiting a bunch of wounded warriors that advancing on behalf of the 101st Airborne Association. Mm -hmm. And after a while, I said, well, I met a lot of these guys. And they were either amputees, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes single, often double. I remember one triple. Uh, and there were a bunch of burn cases. Yeah. And sometimes it was minor, relatively minor. Other times it was like 30, 40 over their right. bodies. And I go like, these guys are going to be forever. Mm -hmm. I said, where is that going to come from? And I said to myself, it's going to come from advocates in Washington. Mm -hmm. So in the space of probably about 48 hours, I joined both the CFW and the Air. Wow. Um, because I wanted to make sure that those guys got long term support. Yeah, absolutely. And that there's other groups, PVA and Disabled Veterans. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other groups out there, like Purple Heart um, Organization. There's a bunch of other groups. It's a big leaders in uh, or, or the VFW in American Legion. I'm pushing advocacy yeah. for uh, for. Uh, veterans in general and they also push push national defense as well but uh, that's why i became a member of both of those organizations the soldier free airmen i think there was a sandwich may have been one coach so um, i want these guys to get long-term continuing care and prosthetics we're at yeah and I've seen, I saw people in burn cases come back to follow up surgery, follow up skin graft, and actually been out to the hospital and back in the syringe community. So, I know you gave a commercial, whatever organization at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, my commercial for, for, your, for your listeners is I want to support that and make sure you belong to. Big venture organizations like the FW American League, so that long term care and support is provided to people that need it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, you can do other things local, mm -hmm. and that's okay too. Doing other things local, I'm writing uh, a veteran service officer, honor guards for uh, funerals, uh, just, just fellowship. All those things are good in themselves on a local basis. With your national uh, efforts in supporting uh, those people in Washington, D.C. who are getting access uh, to the administration, whoever they are, yeah, and also, uh, also the appropriate committee of Congress. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they can't react very well because they don't have much money, but um, other times they, they, will, they will try to step up to the plate. Yeah. And they just need to know that. The issues that are that are problems, right. so that they can step up to the plate. Yeah. And you you you've seen that in your lifetime. That mm -hmm. yeah, they sometimes are frustrating, but often when they understand the issues, they will they will step up to the plate. And that's yeah. where the Nash for that I mean, making sure those issues are understood. Right. Let's get it started. Hello, hello, my friends, and welcome back to the Lost Art Podcast. That podcast is given a voice to our veterans. I'm your host, Andrew Cox, and today we'll be having a My Veteran Story. But before we get into that, are you enjoying the episodes? And be sure to go check us out on our website. That's the lostart.podbean.com. Go check it out. See what we got going on. There is a merchandise tab. Click on that merchandise tab. Go in there and get you a cool hat, shirt, something like that. Uh, help and support us in getting our veteran voices out for all to hear. And also, I want to give a shout out to the Till Valhalla Project for allowing me to be an ambassador for them. That's a great organization. They're doing great things across the nation. So I encourage you to go check out their website. That's tillvahalaproject.com. Uh, so we got through your entire career, even though you, you told me you didn't want to talk about it. Well, we made it. Uh, well, yeah, but we didn't talk, talk in depth about any one thing. Well, true, true. You just hit the wave tops. Yeah, yeah. Now, now I do want to ask one question about it. Uh, as you look back over your time in the in the service, uh, what advice do you have for uh, 
anybody want it, anybody in the military, uh, mm-hmm. and then anybody that's getting out of them. Well, um, uh, the army is a huge undertaking, and it's got many, many pieces. And so the first thing you need to understand is should it be mission oriented? I had I had three things that I posted on my desk for everybody to understand when I commanded BCT. Uh, first thing was mission. Mm-hmm. We exist because we have a mission. If we don't have a mission, then we don't need to exist. Right. So our first first goal, first objective, first touch point on which you evaluate what you do is does it help accomplish the mission? Right. There's lots of things: that individual development, team development, equipment maintenance. Supply activity to make sure you got the right stuff, but you know, is a mission. Mm-hmm. Second, you got to think team. I right. get on that when I said ninety nine guys. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, you wouldn't be here if they didn't think I knew. Right, okay, yeah. so we're a team. And we have different roles, but you need to think mission. You need to think team. And the third thing, very important, really throughout all the military, but especially basic combat training is safety. Mm. All right. Part of the process of BCP is socialization. Bring them in and changing their mindset from eh, whatever I want to do, I can do whatever I want to, mm-hmm. whatever I get to. In the Army, soldierization is you've got to mention, you've got to get it done, and you got to get it done by this time. Right. And, uh, and we expect you to pay attention, mm-hmm. uh, stand up. Uh, when a sergeant, drill sergeant comes into the room, be respectful of officers, follow instructions, all that good stuff. Right. Soldierization. That's actually the word that was like a program instruction for a for BCT. Hmm. That's an objective. But you, you, you got to think in terms of why are we here? There's no reason to be here if you have no mission. Right. Right. Yeah, you can goof off sometimes, but in, in the end, you got to be ready to do the mission. Right. So that's, that's important. Why are you there? Second, it's not just the, it's the team. You're stronger by having more people. Mm-hmm. In the infantry, your squad with uh, light machine guns, uh, grenade launchers, and, and, and rifles, mm-hmm. and the other weapons that can get in, play more than that. And then there's more you can get. But the, the rifle squad succeeds by fire and movement by the application of the weapons. Not the team covers Bravo, where they had a crawl for Bravo covers off. It's a team, and it goes all the way up. Right. Um, important team members are the guys who do surprise. Mm-hmm. Not that they're, they're different, not grunts, but you still need support. Mm-hmm. You still need the uh, maintenance support and all that other stuff that comes in medical. Yeah. Medical. And sometimes you even need a band. That's right. That's right. You got to have the band. Yeah. Okay. So I'm playing up to the fact that I know that you, that you were a band. That's band, right. Band That's person. right. <laughs> but uh, uh, so at, in the military, you need to think mission. Why are we here? Why are we on the payroll? And and be oriented on that. Uh, sometimes the mission comes down from higher. I, the wounded warriors that I met at Dampsey. Mm-hmm. Uh, Basically, they adopted the mindset that my new mission was to get as well as I can get. Right. Right. It wasn't a, uh, they went to ups and downs and psychologically, but uh, it wasn't a full time pity party. You know, all of those made my leg was gone. It, it was more like, oh, yeah, I lost my leg. And they got this device I can learn how to walk with it. Mm-hmm. Aesthetic. Okay. I'm going to get that done. Right. Get as well as I can, or or whatever. Um, so they adopted that as a new mission. It wasn't necessarily imposed or higher. It was they adopted it. Right. That was an interesting mindset. So, so, so that's their teamwork lives, and they always got to think of BCT. Since you're telling them to always listen to you and not do stupid. Mm-hmm. It's your responsibility that it's listening to you, misinterpreted, that you pull them back on the edge and they don't do stupid or 
hurt themselves <laughs> or somebody else. Very true, yeah. Because they're, they're to some degree, they become dependent at the early parts of BCT on what they're telling the girls. The first two weeks, not even allowed out of the unit there. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. And they cut my younger son from slack because he was there. In the first two weeks, I think they were there for Mother's Day. The drill sergeant marched them all down to the telephone. Oh, wow. And they had like two, three minutes to call home and talk to their mom. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they're, they're a very close environment and always supposed to be supervised. You know, don't want them to hurt themselves. But as you get to the end of the of the whole process, mm-hmm. the BCT, Bob, I trying, trying to make them responsible individuals, right? Like the soldiers, mm-hmm. and you know, they've gone through the basic process. Of, yeah, I have to make, I have to do what I'm supposed to do. The guy shot on the beach, right? That not anymore. So they had to walk on. But in the old days, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was shine your boots, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, you, know, you got to get a haircut, and you got to learn material, and, right? You know all that, all that stuff. Um, but safety does apply throughout. And I think the more rank you get, uh, the senior NCOs and the more senior officers, they they have either seen so many tragic safety situations, casualties, or have heard so many, right? That they're going on, like, all right, I don't need any of that crap. Yeah. And it's, it's bad for the individuals involved, for the families involved, it's bad for the military brothers and the killers. And I think, yeah. yeah. I think as time goes on, um, the privates and the young second lieutenants, they're not as plugged into that. Mm-hmm. Uh, they gain a little bit of it as they become young go. But by the time they get to be sergeant major, first sergeant, sergeant major, um, they've they've seen or experienced enough of that that safety is probably the built-in requirement. In the yeah, and the senior field very officer, the tank commander, they um, they they begin to see that as something that they have to embrace, mm-hmm. much more so than when they were uh, an officer. Um, so to answer your question on the military side, I would say that those three things that I said, you should evaluate all your actions by those three. How right. do we help the mission? How do we do it as a team? And how do we uh, do it safely? Uh, it's probably like that. As you go into the civilian life, you're going to be somewhat different than your peers because um, you have a different set of experiences than your peers. Uh, your peers will have not gone through uh, experience that that makes you mission focused, right? That gets you to think about the team necessarily, um, and they may not have been in a happy environment, so they're somewhat totally insensible to safety. Um, well, maybe as smart as you are, and maybe as well as educated as you are, but they haven't got that uh, experience that you got as a, as a soldier, even if you're just in a short period of time um, as a listed person in the office. Mm-hmm. I don't talk about warrants very much because they kind of fall in shadow lane. <laughs> you know, they, they were former, for the most part, former NCOs. And, uh, disappear into that to that world of being a warrant officer, and they stay. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, in reserves, I had I had a warrant officer who hit, hit age sixteen. He was retired, and he came back and worked for like a buck a day. So they docked his retirement pay for every day to work for the Army Reserve. He had to file for the work for the Army Army, and somebody first the Secretary of the Army had to sign off that he could continue to. To be in the reserves over age 60, drawing retirement pay, and wow. still, still do that. Um, and Chief Ratman, he was, he was, I think he still may be alive, but uh, he had a wealth of knowledge in, 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 in supply. Yeah. Uh, particularly unit supply, but also with what I call support supply. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. The, uh, 
they, so they don't really tend to get out all that much. Mm-hmm. Like I'm listed in office. But you're going to be different. And some people are going to resent it. Mm-hmm. And so you just don't try to emphasize it too much. Um, no, the first meeting I went to in Southwestern Bell, they were discussing the timeline and how to answer requests for a certain service. And I'm looking at this, going like, well, why are we not interleaving this activity? Mm-hmm. You know, they were doing it, well, when Joe finishes, but Mike is part of it, and Mike finishes the Yeah. Well, this guy, not dependent on anything with these guys. Why can't we do something in parallel so that we do it faster? Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was, to me, it was fairly simple, but um, it probably had to do with when you're doing military operation plan. You have multiple units that are moving, mm-hmm. and they're moving in parallel, and they're off the mission. Well, good off borders have human maneuver and a fire support plan. Right. So you're all automatically thinking about how am I going to move my, my unit mm-hmm. and how am I going to deliver artillery support? And then right. you go on from there, you might have uh, all sorts of other types of support, supply that you had to think of where the supply is. Where the A station is going to be, um, where the headquarters is going to be, and all these parts are, are going to try to move in parallel and, mm-hmm. and synchronize. And go, I'm making this really hard. Nobody can do anything but the guy in front of me. This guy doesn't even know anything about what this is. Yeah. He, he's providing an input that as you go down the line, all the inputs come together. Some have a dependencies, but in the end, you're getting down to one guy who has the final answer mm-hmm. and puts it together. You're just putting pieces together. So why not put them together? And they adopted it. Uh, my suggestion. And uh, that was literally the first meeting I was ever in in South Africa. Wow. But it was just, what was the objective? The objective was to get the customer an answer as soon as possible Mm -hmm. and make it as accurate as possible based on the input. Right. All right, that was what we were doing. And we were a team. This group provided this information, this group did this. Mm -hmm. And we, we had to get done. I worked on that. I worked in that particular area of the company about eight or nine months, and then they shifted me to something else. Mm. Uh, but carry your attributes and your your experiences forward, mm. but not a lot of people are going to be necessarily interested in really what you did. Right. Uh, the interviewers may de- delve into it a little bit, because uh, that's part of the job I always. We right. could tell them into your resume and your background, try to figure out whether, if you, do you know anything that will help us? Right. You know, are you capable of doing anything that would help? Mm-hmm. And you can get that from various places. Right. Obviously, some skills are more transferable to uh, civilian world than others. If you're an instruction engineer in the Army, you can run a bulldozer or a trader. Yeah. Operate. Other construction material, you know, very easily. Um, Grunts probably more aptitude for security. Mm-hmm. Um, although I did have a star major. I can't remember. Oh, star major. Man, star major wing. Second battalion, tenth infantry. First unit I was ever in. He said, "You can." Make an infantryman do anything. He would. He can do anything in the world because if he screws it up, he's going to be in the line. <laughs> so if you got a job that needs to be done that's a little odd and offbeat, you can go get an infantryman and he'll do it. Because otherwise, he's got to go back to the line. <laughs> he was. Uh, he was special forces qualified. Yeah. Got him. A, well, he would look as old to me as second lieutenant, but he had quite a bit of experience. Right. Mm. But there is some truth in that. And infantry has to be pretty flexible. Mm-hmm. If you're a veteran and you're struggling, you need some help, don't forget that the VA does have some incredible resources. 
you can always dial 988, press option 1. You can also text 838-255, or you can go to veteranscrisisline.net, click on that chat icon. Any of those options are going to be to put you in contact with somebody that can help you out. But remember, one veteran life loss is one too many. I care about you. The veteran community cares about you. So please reach out for help. And if you're a veteran out there and you're not struggling and you're doing well, well, don't forget about your fellow veterans that you serve with. Reach out to them. Ask them how they're doing. And if they need a helping hand, go ahead and help them out as well. With that, I hope you enjoyed the show. Stay motivated. Change your socks.